This morning we're continuing in a sermon series about the cults of the American civic religion. What is America's civic religion made of? This morning I want to invite you to think with me about the cult of freedom and the doctrine of freedom. What does it mean to be free? In America, we talk about freedom all the time. We sing about freedom all the time. That word might just be the single favorite word of the citizens and non-citizens cohabitating these lands. We all agree that freedom is a good thing, that freedom is the best thing, that freedom is the necessary thing. But what does it mean to be free? Historically, freedom in America has not been about freedom for everyone, everywhere, all at once. In fact, American freedoms tend to be constructed for the few on the basis of the subjugation of the many. People were celebrating the idea of freedom for as long as European pilgrims and refugees were coming to the shores of the New World. But their freedom was built on the premise of enslavement and ethnic cleansing. There was something deeply wrong with the meaning of freedom that shaped America. And yet we have continued to celebrate freedom from one age of this nation to the next as if it means what we want it to mean rather than what it really does mean. I think what we want it to mean is that everyone gets to choose the life they want to live and then live that life. But if we are being more honest, most people imagine freedom meaning that we all get to participate in the exhilarating bacchanalia of American excess. It's about the freedom to get the things we want when we want them. This notion of freedom is deeply baked into our national DNA. It is one of the doctrines of America's civic religion. It took shape in those early days of the colonists who came to the New World, gripping the doctrine of discovery, a literal document which was a mandate of the Holy Church to take what they want, because this is what God wanted for them. So the pillaging of native lands and the annihilation of native tribes and cultures came with the blessing of the church and the mandate that man must be free. Freedom meant to take what you want when you want it. And if anything or anyone gets in the way of that, they are an obstacle sent by the devil, which the devil has put in the way of your sacred freedom. As America has evolved, the means of subjugation have also evolved. First it was the natives, and then it was the Italians and the Irish, and then it was enslaved Africans, and then it was the descendants of those enslaved peoples, along with migrants and refugees and felons, and all untouchables of all kinds who are on the bottom of America's caste system. Through every age of American society, the meaning of freedom has not changed, which meant that the conditions of freedom still had to be met. And the conditions of American freedom mean that someone has to be on the bottom so that those on the top can feel free. Because the thing about getting what you want when you want it is that somebody has to give it to you. Your gain is somebody else's loss. The American way to stretch out your arms into the clean blue air of freedom is to stand on someone else's back. Today, those enabling our freedom by their subjugation are dispersed around the world, out of sight and out of mind. Many still live in our communities, to be sure, though most often they are pushed to the farthest margins, out of our collective peripheral vision. The people who work in retail on the Gold Coast do not live on the Gold Coast. But all Americans, no matter how poor, have been implicated in the waste and destruction of human life that is inextricable from what we mean when we talk about freedom. All Americans, 
have been indoctrinated in the cult of freedom, which means what I want, when I want it. And the cost of that freedom is children working in cobalt mines in the Congo. The cost is Mexican rainforests that have been burned to the ground to expand avocado plantations. The cost is rivers in Indonesia that have been bled dry by fast fashion factories and then filled with metric tons of polyester scraps. The cost is the enslaved labor of American prisons. The cost is the mass extinction of the Earth's biodiversity. The cost of our freedom is the American military's routine obliteration of villages and families on the other side of the world, because as the saying goes, freedom isn't free. What does it mean to be free? I'd like to suggest that when we are talking about freedom in America, that thing has nothing to do with actual freedom. But we are actually using this word freedom as a code word for self-determination. Self-determination is the idolatry of personal appetite. It says, if I want it, if I have an appetite for it, that means I need to have it. Whether that thing be the newest iPhone model, or the leather pants that Kendall Jenner wore to the Olympics, or attractive land that's especially nice looking, or even another person's body. If I want it, I need to have it. Taking what we want when we want it is an American form of religious devotion. But in this religion, the gods are the squirming, bottomless appetites. In America, the level of your self-determination depends on your place in the American caste system. Now, traditionally, Anglo-Saxon white males have been the most, have had the most permissive warrant for self-determination, while the rest of the world was organized to fulfill those desires. And what has kept people motivated to contribute to this insane economy is the belief that the doctrine of freedom means that those on the bottom, too, if they just work hard enough, can attain the level of self-determination of those elite few white men. That is the American dream. Claw your way to the top of the food system, where you are in control of what you consume and when you consume it, and everyone below you exists to feed your desires. This isn't how we like to see ourselves, but it's the fact of the matter. Because you cannot have cheap food, or cheap fashion, or cheap access to tropical groceries, or easy access to lines of credit without someone paying the price on the other side. Today, self-determination is the centerpiece of American politics. Everybody wants it, everybody feels entitled to it, and everybody is impatient to get it. With slogans on the left and the right, like, my body, my choice, whether that refers to reproductive health or the right to refuse vaccines. My freedom to own guns, my freedom to own an SUV, my freedom to be whoever I want and whatever I want, my freedom to say what I want, because it is a free country. It's no wonder that so many people get anxious about the theology of freedom. This is one of the most common things that I hear people worry about when they talk about God and theology. This so-called problem of free will. If God knows everything before it happens, do we have free will? And if we don't have free will, does God even love us? People get so uncomfortable with the idea of a God who would take away our freedom. I have come to believe that people aren't asking the question, does God love my val and value my freedom? And by the way, the answer to that is yes. God loves your freedom. But what people really want to know, what people really worry about, 
is does God love and value my self-determination? And the answer to that, beloved, is no. God does not make us to be free in this way that American freedom means. We were not made to despoil the earth and to exploit one another just so we could have the latest toys and the trendiest clothes and overstuffed bank accounts. When God made us free, God was doing something very different. God was not making us free to have. God was making us free to be. The way that I have learned about this is by watching my dog. I've learned a lot from watching my dog. When I got my dog, Bella, three years ago, she was the first animal that I had ever had, the first dog I'd ever had. And so I brought the same logic to our relationship that I bring to every part of my life as an acculturated American who values freedom. I wanted her to be happy, and I wanted her to feel dignity, and I thought the solution was to give her freedom. If she wanted to be on the couch, she could be on the couch. If she wanted to chase a squirrel, she could chase the squirrel. If she wanted to go sniff and pee on something, she could do it. I took for granted that she knows what she wants, and she will be happy if she gets what she wants. This is freedom. And this is the same logic that we want God to have when it comes to our lives. We want God to take for granted that we know what we want, and for God to make us happy by giving us the things we want when we want them. God, I want it. Give it to me. It's the reduction of most prayers. But when it came to my dog, I was dead wrong. Within a week, what I had on my hands was the world's most anxious animal. She was suffering, and she was erratic, and she was completely unmanageable because I was making her believe that she had to figure out this world on her own and that she had to be in charge of her own life. And it turns out that this doesn't make her happy. This makes her disintegrate. What I learned over the course of many months is that my dog needs a pack leader. And I had to get comfortable with being the pack leader. I had to get comfortable with having a will for my dog and for her to learn to follow my will. I had to make the decisions about when she eats and when she goes outside and when she pees, when she says hello to strangers, and even when she is allowed to leave her doggy bed. And all this might sound like she is less free, but she is actually far more free than she was when she was allowed to have whatever she wanted. People misunderstand this because of that tricky confusion between freedom and self-determination. My dog is free, but she does not have self-determination. Because it turns out that those two things are mutually exclusive. And here's why there is a difference. Bella is a pack animal, and in a pack, individuals have roles depending on their abilities. Now, my dog contributes to the pack her special abilities of cuddling and doing tricks and being silly and being a love bug. She does not contribute the skills of navigating the city and finding food and finding shelter. And the way that she gets free from her anxiety about those things she does not control is by learning to trust me. That takes time and it takes consistency. But in the process, she learns to respond to my will. And if I want her to walk beside me, she does. If I want her to go lie down, she does. Now, she still has a mischievous and stubborn spirit at times. But she has learned to find peace in obedience. And in that peace, there's a freedom that surpasses self-determination. We are out here acting like freedom means being able to chase and catch and kill every squirrel that we want. But that's not freedom. Freedom comes from being in tune and in line with the will of a God who loves us. 
Just like Jesus said in this passage of scripture today, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Even Jesus surrendered self-determination to make himself subject to the will of God the Creator. And how could we do any better than imitating Jesus? Self-determination is an infectious disease which breeds anxiety and fear and despair. Because self-determination relies on this logic of rugged individualism. This American belief that every person is alone. Every person must strive to be on the top of this competition in the world for scarce resources. But we are not individuals by nature. God, in fact, made us descendants of primates, which means that just like wolves, we are pack animals. We are meant to be in community of interdependence and collective care. And being in community requires surrendering the rugged individualism and the rugged self-determination. We cannot have what we want when we want it, because that always comes at the expense of others in the pack. And the pack can only be as strong as its weakest member. The only way for you and I to be well is for every person to be well, from the south side of Chicago to Indonesia. It means giving up self-will, but it also means gaining freedom. Because if we're being honest, there is no freedom in self-determination. It is slavery to bottomless greed. It is loneliness and alienation. It is the horrifying drift into infinite entropy. In the pack, we do not always get what we want when we want it. But what we do get is peace and security from knowing who we are and what we are here to do. We gain the freedom from the anxiety to figure it all out, to get everything we want and think we need, and to be alone in life and alone in death. But the thing that about humans, which sets our packs apart from other primates and canines, is that we have been adopted into a larger pack. In fact, into God's own pack. The wolves, the wolves are driven by a collective will, but we, on the other hand, can be driven by the will of the creator of the universe, who knows every desire we have, and who in fact wants the things we want, but who knows how to get them better than we ever could. Freedom comes from surrendering to the one who loves us, who longs for us to be happy, and who wants us to be free. As Jesus said, Everything the Father gives me will come to me. There is nothing we lose and never anything we lack when we surrender to the will of God. We have nothing to lose, but we have everything to gain, including our freedom. Amen.